is what is the end game of the woke tyranny look like right because uh michael i i agree with you in that if you just analyze uh, the circumstances and, and and apply it with the model that i believe to be true what they're doing does seem to have absolutely no longevity possible right it's a self-destructive thing that should come apart on its own but what does it look like for us while we're living through it what does the end game of the woke tyranny look like what does it look like to you curtis well, I, if I can answer that at the same time as as answer, answering Michael, I do unfortunately hear a lot of what uh, sounds like cope here. Um, I hate to hear it. I hate to point it out, but this is cope, and the self, the the self winning victory is the the bugaboo of conservatism. You always hear it. You hear, oh, you know, this is a self destructive thing. It's going to end at its own game. Let, let me lay out a couple of different angles. First of all, we have the future. We here in America have the future very very near us. We can see the future very very clearly. All you got to do is drive south. And um, you see, you know, the structure of third world governance in all of its various forms. It has a Cuban aspect, it has a Venezuelan aspect, it has an Argentinian aspect, it has a Brazilian aspect. Uh, certainly as we open the borders um, and we mix these populations more thoroughly, those, those realities become much, much more manifest. And so you can picture a US <clears throat> in 50 or 100 years that is in some ways very, very similar to Mexico today. And you know, the fact is, if you have any really, if you really have any money at all, it's possible to live very well in Mexico. And life in Mexico is, is very good for the Mexican elite. Uh, you know, the people you see on the telenovelas, you know, the uh, fresas, uh, as a, you know, the, uh, or as conquistador Americans, as Steve Saylor calls them, uh, they live fine. Um, you know, as for, you know, Los Estados Unidos de Mexico, you know, um, uh, and it's beautiful constitution and it's a fucking joke and you can also clearly see the future in that because you see parastate entities exercising more and more authority uh this is again similar to the decline of the roman empire where you have these these mysterious groups called the bagaude which appear to have been just like romans who went rogue and you know started living in a barbaric way um you have all of these things can play out even in Mexico for 50, 100, 150, 200 years. Over time, I, you know, I think you will start to see a recognition that the real government is whatever narco gang manages to unify the, the to unite the tribes, you know, but that's that's a very, very clear future. That's sort of your path to barbarism. Uh, that was, you know, the sort of path path to barbarism that late Rome followed. Uh, you can take that path and eventually you'll end up with a new kind of monarchy through that form. Many, many pieces of the old world will still be intact. It's kind of Mad Max. And your alternative is basically not to go full Mad Max and instead to perform the same kind of transformation that really saved the Roman world late, you know, in that period. Another, you know, let me go a little more far-fetched and, you know, with a slightly more northern uh, example. Um, when uh, I was uh, until recently of the uh, glorious Bay Area, when you look at what people think and the way they live in the Bay Area, um, I think it's not unimaginable that by the later 21st century, um, mandatory universal sterilization could be a viable political alternative. I could see people supporting that. And that would be a very, uh, you know, first it would be optional. It would be like a good thing that you did. Then it would be like you would be sort of disgraced for not doing it. Then, bam, everyone would have to do it. They would live out their lives happily and disappear. Whether they could enforce that on the whole planet or not, I, I greatly doubt. But, you know, that, that, that strain has existed in the West before. You see the shakers and so forth. Uh, also, you know, basically a puritanical kind of people. So that's, that's one, you know, kind of model for voluntary human extinction that I think you could start to see become politically viable in a few generations. So, yeah, actually, you could, you could continue to work around with this conservatives and bullshit. And um, we could see whether either of those futures happens. So there's probably more, you know, kind of dire black pills that I can think of. But, um, you know, those are just the two that come to hand. 
We're going to lock well, okay. arms and walk hand in hand into the ocean together, huh? Is that what's going to happen, the idea, Michael? The idea, that, the idea that collapse is a victory, I reject, and is a, is a mistaken interpretation. No, 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 I no. I, I don't think First, of it. Sorry, go on. Because it would be, A, it would be hell for all of us to live through. Even if what re resulted on the other side is superior to this, it would be hell for all of us to live through. But it also would be in no sense a victory because we wouldn't have brought it about, right? The Russian people ultimately did not bring down the USSR or communism. It wasn't, even though I would say Russia in 2021 is better than Russia in 1989, right? They didn't win a victory. Their thing broke because it didn't work anymore. And if I, that's all I'm saying about woke managerial tyranny. Um, the, the other reason to doubt, which I did spell out in my book, in fact, I think I called the whole chapter Reasons to Doubt, uh, and, I, and, and I, I went into detail. We've been hearing, I've, been he I've been hearing this, the following argument for a long time, which sounds like what Curtis just said. He even mentioned Brazil. The people said that Brazil is the future of the USA. The reason to doubt that that is possible in the following sense is that I think we underestimate the extent to which dysfunctional regimes around the world exist and function to the extent that they function under an umbrella of US military, economic, and political power. And if the United States becomes as dysfunctional as they are, can Mexico still be Mexico without El Norte above doing all of the things that it does? I think Curtis and I would certainly agree that the United States is not nearly as competent at the tasks it sets itself internationally, to say nothing of domestically, as it used to be. Once it is as incompetent, or you know, medium competent, if we want to say uh, these other countries don't shoulder these kinds of imperial, quasi imperial responsibilities. And I'm not saying it's a wonderful thing that America does, and we have to keep it going forever. I am saying that in its absence, it is uh, probably unrealistic, or certainly uh, in not evident that the United States could simply transform itself or devolve into a country like that and just go on when the system that we have that all these countries exist within and under depends on the exercise of US power in a way that the US seems increasingly incapable of doing and even less and less capable of doing as it becomes more and more ridiculously ambitious about it. Um, so I don't, I, 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 I look, I, like I said, I'm usually the I'm usually the black pill guy in a lot of respects. Uh, I don't I'm not convinced that good things are coming. Um, I'm convinced that good things are possible. Uh, and, and you know, a lot of what Curtis says sounds plausible, but in a way, I'm going to say it could be worse than what Cur if the if the if what Curtis just predicted happens. I think it'll be worse than the way he said because there won't be this overarching security umbrella, economics, all of it. Granted, it's 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 jury rigged and strung together. And, and very fragile, but without it, uh, if the U.S. just becomes another dysfunctional, semi quasi third world country, I think it, it, uh, being able to live like an elite in Mexico or Brazil can live now is not going to be nearly as possible as Curtis thinks, because a lot of that possibility depends on even, you know, quasi competent exercise of U.S. power, which will be gone, either both the competence and the power. Well, Michael, you you did work in the U.S. National Security Administration, so uh, you know, uh, literally in the U.S. National Security Administration. So no, uh, I didn't. You know, no, 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 I no. Technically, the the National Security Administration, the NSA. Council. Yeah, 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 yeah. I sorry, did not work. No, yeah, I. Sorry, brain fart. Those brain are the guys fart. Who I, made your emails you worked in national call. security. You worked in national security in the administration, is what I meant to say. Um, and if you look at the NSC and specifically the term national security, um, this is a very interesting term that dates to the 30s and 40s. It really dates back to when Roosevelt said our frontier is on the Rhine, um, which is, I believe, a river in Texas. And um, that uh, that euphemism, one of the things that was so fascinating about the whole series of shit that went down in 9-11 was that suddenly they had to invent this new term. They came up with this term, homeland security. What is homeland security? How is it different from national security? And that was a little bit Orwellian. And the truth is that what national security has meant since the 1930s, uh, you know, arguably since the kind of the inquiry in the teens and 20s, um, the whole sort of very early days of the international community, going back to even like the whole Cecil Rhodes world, you have um, this whole concept that the security defending the United States depends on exercising, holding this umbrella over Uruguay or whatever the 
So, you know, we have these treaties with like Portugal where um, it's a national security treaty and the treaty says that if Portugal is attacked, the United States will defend it. And if the United States was attacked, Portugal will help defend us. This is literally the language of NATO. And it's all a bunch of crap. And let me tell you um, what I think would happen if the U.S. simply uh, renounced the whole umbrella, uh, closed its embassies, said, OK, let's take Mexico as an example. We said to Mexico, OK, you know what our new policy with respect to Mexico is? Our new policy is, uh, with respect to Mexico is the policy that was set out in the Monroe Doctrine Address, um, not with respect to Latin America, but with respect to Europe. And one of the phrases in that, uh, that address from, what was it, 1830, something like that, um, was, uh, which was actually, I think, ghosted by John Quincy Adams and which was ex inspired by, by Canning, the British Foreign Secretary, was um, the policy with respect to Europe is, and I quote, the government de facto is the government de jure for us. Meaning that basically whoever is in control of the goddamn country uh, is, um, um, is, is in charge of it and can do whatever he wants. Well, you know, if you go back through, uh, through Mexican history, there's this wonderful saying in, uh, in Mexican politics, I believe this is due to Porfirio Diaz, um, where he said, uh, Mexico, tan lejos de Dios, tan cerca de los Estados Unidos. Uh, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. Um, and um, I'll tell you, uh, you know, an interaction I had once with a Mexican, this was at some uh, venture capital thing. Uh, this, this Mexican is um, now, I think he's a billionaire now, um, but uh, that was long before uh, we were just uh, we were just kids. And uh, so I sit down next to this guy and uh, I'm like, uh, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're going to like a whitewater rafting thing or something. And I'm like, hey, uh, where are you from? Um, and he's, uh, you know, what's your name? He's like, my name is Juan. I'm like, where are you from, Juan? Um, he's like, uh, Me Mexico. I'm like, oh, let me tell you about my favorite Mexican, Porfirio Diaz. You know, that's kind of like saying, let me tell you about my favorite American, Richard Nixon. So he's like, oh, <laughs> let me tell you about my favorite Mexican. I'm like, who? He's like, Hernan Cortez, right? So, you know, one of the things you have to, to remember about the country to our south, whose true name, by the way, is New Spain, um, that uh, under the Spanish Empire, this was actually by far the most conservative part of the Spanish Empire, as many empires are. You know, they used to say when you entered Rhodesia, you should set your watches back 50 years. Um, the Mexican nobility was still a thing. The people who are descendants of the Mexican nobility very much know that. They only breed with other Mexican nobles. Um, and if you tell this country, hey, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want, there will be some general down there who was like, if as long as they take you completely seriously, really, you know, at your word, this is a true policy, you're like, okay, I could just basically take power and shoot all the drug dealers, forget this ridiculous system of justice that America has like saddled me with, restore order in the goddamn country, go full. And you know, if you go to Mexico, anything that still works down there was basically made by Porfirio Diaz. You know, what happened when Porfirio Diaz was overthrown? Well, he was like, okay, I you know, guess democracy is the future. Let's go back on a you know democratic future. Uh the um someone attempted to um uh, Huerta, I believe, attempted to basically continue his rule. Woodrow Wilson's like, no, you're going to have democracy, so you're going to get it good and hard, so we're going to support Carranza. And then the radicals in America supported Pancho Villa, which is why he still has a good name in the U.S. And, you know, or, for example, during the Civil War, Napoleon III was like, oh, well, I guess, uh, wow, the Monroe Doctrine isn't really operational anymore because you seem to be fighting for your life. So let's restore order in Mexico. We'll get an Austrian prince and put him in charge in Mexico. Well, if you find something in Mexico that uh, works, that was not put there by Porfirio Diaz, that does not date to the Spanish, it was very likely put there by Emperor Maximilian. Civil War ends. It's over. What is the, you know, kind of, you know, the first action of the U.S.? It's like basically, I forget if it's Grant or Sherman. It's like, oh, now we have this giant army. Hey, France, do you want to fight us too? Better pull out of Mexico. And that's how the sort of the Maximilian period ends. So the thing is that you have to understand that when people accuse the U.S. of supporting Pinochet in Chile or something like that, what they're really saying is you didn't do enough to oppose him. And if you withdraw that umbrella, what you're going to see in every country in the world is you're going to see indigenous forces rapidly realize they could, that they can go basically full Paul Kagame 
and restore all the goddamn order that they want. So when that, that umbrella vanishes, yes, in the long term, that'll create an opportunity for other imperial powers. But if that umbrella were to actually vanish, you wouldn't see Mexico or Brazil fall to pieces. You'd see an amazing restoration of civilization in those countries. Thank <laughs> you.